I think obstacle course racing is the most round, well-rounded sport because you do have things like hand-eye coordination if you throw a spear or something. Um, you have uh, weight carry. You need to carry weight, lift, lift and pull things that you would normally do in a in your day-to-day life, whether you know it or not. Like lifting something onto a high shelf, that's that's an actual movement that humans do. Climbing over something, going up and down stairs, these are actual human movements, and they're all packaged up in fun stuff. Basically, giant playground, and including like slides and and climbs and nets and a frames and all these kind of cool things that are made up. Hey friends, welcome to this week's episode of the Human Podcast. This is your host Jeffrey Wu. You've heard of Spartan races, Tough Mudders, and the popular TV series Ninja Warrior. These activities or sports actually all fall under the umbrella of obstacle course racing. In 2014, the World Obstacle Course Racing Federation was formed as the international governing body to supervise and sanction the sport. And in this episode, I speak with the president, Ian Adamson. He's an experienced and world record-breaking adventure racer. We touched upon the history of the sport with its roots in military training. We talk about Ian's war stories as an obstacle course racer discusses nutrition and recovery strategies, and ultimately the explosive growth and popularity of the sport. Hope you guys enjoy the show and learn something new. Hey Ian, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. So adventure racing, obstacle course racing. Um, I did actually did my first Spartan race at the San Francisco Giant Stadium uh, about six months ago. Uh, It was our company and a few of us decided to do a Spartan race together. for the folks who haven't tried Spartan races or done Tough Mudders or don't want, don't know what adventure races are, can you describe this new sport? Uh, that's a good question. It's pretty much what people have been doing uh, since the dawn of time, but with our ability now, and certainly in industrialized and advanced countries or more, more economically um, advantageous countries, we have more leisure time. So having leisure time, people tend to still be driven to do these um, adventurous things. Uh, a lot of obstacle course races today don't know any of the history. Um, it's not new. This stuff has been around for a very, very long time. In the modern era, uh, obstacle competitions, as we recognize them, they were really formalized by the military. Uh, and the first military competitions were in the World Military Games, and it was 1946 that it became an actual event. Uh, it's actually of military pentathlon. And people these days, they see the military pentathlon runs, which are quite short. I think it's 600 meters, and they mm. go uh, very, very fast over uh, a set of standard obstacles. It's highly developed. Um, obstacles that everyone who does the Tough Mudder or Spartan race would recognize. Humans have been doing this for a really long time. And the formalized races uh, most commonly today uh, are recognized because of Tough Mudder and Spartan race who hit social media. Mm-hmm. That's really what did the resurgence. You know, everything's kind of cyclical. Right. So if you go back to the early stages, it was actually the late 1800s uh, when it became a military thing. And then competition was formalized in 1946. Uh, a tough guy emerged in 1986. And he was not the first, but he, he did stuff that really looks like today's races, the closest to today's races. Social media, I believe, really kicked it into gear and it went from a few thousand people doing races around the world um, in what we recognize as obstacle to, we think about 20 million today. Yeah. Uh, and it's obvious, it's obvious, isn't it? If you, you can watch TV and see something flipping channels or it hits your social media feed and it spreads virally across the internet and then everyone knows about it and they yeah. go, Hey, that looks great. Selfies and mud and run and beer and fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's absolutely just to me when, when I first heard about the sport, it seemed like a nice day out, right? It's just like a fun, adventurous day out in the sun. Um, and I remember the first time I met Joe DeSena, who's the founder of Spartan Race. He was telling me that I think a million people has done this, had done the Spartan Race that year, and he wanted to make it an Olympic sport. And at first, I thought I was like, "What are you talking about? Are you, are you crazy?" But then he realized that sports are just fairly arbitrary, right? Like, why is basketball an Olympic sport? Why is baseball? Why is tennis an Olympic sport, right? Like, these are all pretty arbitrary movements and techniques. And if you think about obstacle racing and just traversing territory, obstacle racing is 
pretty a, a very primal movement. So it actually started making sense. Yeah, like why not obstacle course race, course racing as an Olympic sport? I agree. It's uh, you're right about the 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 nice day out. I think that's one of the things that really gives attraction is that it's a nice day out. It's a really nice day out, yeah. and you get to do it with your friends, and you get to have a beer at the end, and it's fun, and it's it's in it's um natural to how we move. I think that as humans, we we do have a great capacity to run, move, climb, carry. That's what makes us human. Um, and using that uh, in a race is people don't necessarily understand why they like it, but it's because the exact same reason that kids play in a playground. If you take them to a playground, they don't sit and watch. They go and play on the stuff. Right. Well, adults are no different. We just tend to get a little disconnect as we age with what is intrinsically uh, fun for us and something that we do as humans. Yeah. So that's obviously one of the many reasons that makes it to me a real tangible, fun, engaging uh, activity, if you like. Yeah. So would you describe for our audience here who might have done an obstacle course, right? Like, what are the main obstacles? I know it is, you know, things like rope climbs or carries. Do you guys bucket that into different categories? How do you think about it formally? I, I think you would, there's no formal, uh, construct around what the obstacles are, but I tend to say under over through. Okay. So you go over something, under something, through something, and then you carry something or lift or drag. So there's weight typically involved. Um, useful stuff, things that people would do in undeveloped countries in their daily routine. They're going to carry water probably and firewood and uh, they're going to maybe uh, go up and down hills and they might have to run if they're late for something. So that's normal to what humans do in the natural environment, naturalish environment. And it's really no different. It's tapping into those, the human skills that we have as a very well-rounded human. Yeah. And I, I think obstacle course racing is the most round, well-rounded sport because you do have things like hand-eye coordination. If you throw a spear or something, um, you have uh, weight carry. You need to carry weight, lift, lift and pull things that you would normally do in a in your day-to-day life, whether you know it or not. Like lifting something onto a high shelf. That's that's an actual movement that humans do. Right. Climbing over something, going up and down stairs. These are actual human movements, and they're all packaged up in fun stuff. Basically, giant playground. Yeah, and including like slides and, <laughs> and climbs and nets and a frames and all these kind of cool things that are made up, uh, which also ends up being things like American Ninja Warrior does a very good job of compressing everything into a space that is very intense. Yeah. What You mentioned the military roots or one of the military inspirations of obstacle course racing. And I've had the honor to visit a couple uh, naval special warfare bases, both on Little Creek, Virginia and Coronado. And that obstacle course that they have the BUDS candidates go race through is such a central part of SEAL training. Um, it, that just reminded me that, yes, like I, I've seen it with my eyes. Like they they have like the logs that you crawl over and crawl under. I mean, if you just go on YouTube and look at some of the BUDS obstacle courses, you can, you know, it, it's, it's a, I think, a publicly uh, known challenge. Um, I, I'm curious you know, what were the inspirations there? I mean, obviously, I guess, you know, if you're traversing through a battlefield, you're just crawling and going under and over, as, as you were saying. Um, I'm curious, in terms of like the military uh, techniques, like, how much of an interface are there with the best practice from the military, with the athletes? Curious how much cross-pollination there is still. Well, the, the military school courses have a very specific reason for what they do. It's because of, of combat readiness. Right. So if you look at the special forces like the SEALs, the Rangers, um, and all of the other branches of the military, what they're doing is they're, they're encapsulating things that they actually need. So they do it in a way that they can do in a very short space of time and then create a pass-fail, basically. Like, if you can't do this, you're not ready. Right. So you've got to be ready. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to pass it. Yeah. Um, and then the, the modern obstacle course race elements have borrowed heavily from military. The the first one to really do it in a big way was Tough Guy out in England in okay. 1986, and he was recreating the trenches of warfare in the First World War, amongst other things, but then started adding in these kind of military-like uh, training obstacles. So yeah. that's the military tie. And then the the historic root of that goes back to a French guy in about 1899, I think, um, who was looking at 
functional training for all humans. And it was, it really, it's the common route, interestingly, to parkour, kind of this human movement. Yeah, parkour um, looks really fun too. Yeah, and yeah. there is, a, there is a, a relationship that most people are not aware of. Is that, that, you know, so we're 100 years past that now, but right. they, di- they kind of diverged. And one went to the military training route, and then parkour was more of this overall um, human training thing which has evolved to now become, in some cases, competition. Yeah. Because they also are in the uh, system for recognition by the Olympic Committee to be uh, recognized as a sport. And that's where, actually, you asked an earlier, you asked an earlier question, uh, you know, what's, what makes something a sport? Right. Um, well, there is a big difference between an activity and a sport. And this, is, this causes a lot of conversation around obstacle course racing because some people, quite rightly in some respects, will say, well, it shouldn't be a sport. We don't do that. We this is our thing. We do this, and it's that's not what what we do. Of course, the answer is to me. My my answer to that is, well, their concern appears to be formalizing the structure around a sport uh, includes creating standards, but the standards are not what a lot of people think of. The standards are, are to make the sport uh, safer, cheaper, more accessible uh, for most people. And that really means standards are things like you have a general structure around the standards of is that obstacle safely designed, constructed, and maintained? That's mm-hmm. a standard. It doesn't change the obstacle. It allows the, the race producers to make whatever obstacles they want, provided it doesn't fall down and kill someone. So that's a standard. Another standard would be uh, a standard of medical care. So you're going to have things like, well, uh, if, their water, if the water is more than six inches deep and you can't see the person, then you have to have um, we have to have stuff around that to make sure that the people don't die in the water. Right. And you have a minimum level of medical, uh, emergency medical services around that and then protocols to deal with it. Yeah. There's safety things that do not affect the race other than make it safer. Yeah. Uh, making things safer also drives down the insurance costs. That makes them cheaper. Hmm. So when people say, well, you know, you're going to wreck the sport by formalizing and standardizing it, not standardizing the nature of these evolving things, this kind of dynamic growing animal of obstacle course racing, which goes off in unexpected directions, um, that's not what it is. So the structure is different. The structure of sport is really affording the ability to get to a bigger platform yeah, um, and a route for people who want to compete to compete at a high level in a structural way so that it's accessible to absolutely everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think the argument that makes sense for me is that, you know, I'm just thinking of I'm going to pick on rowing because you know I you know we have one of our colleagues on the team rode for Great Britain is a t- double world champion rower, but like no one watches rowing. Like I don't even know how many rowers there are. If 20 million people did an obstacle course racing last year, uh, in a lot of ways, obstacle course course racing is a bigger sport than rowing. Even though I, yeah. I personally love rowing, it's it's like a fun activity and obviously a lot of history with the Oxford Cambridge boat race and and all of that, but. In the sense of sport and, and involving people, I think there's something towards the fact that sport is an activity or, or, or a competition they can do with other people, right? And there's clearly some signal that's going on that people are gravitating towards this modern sport of obstacle course racing. Yeah, that, that's, that's the way I think about it. It's like, okay, right. if people want to do this as an activity. They want to compete in it. Like, who are we to judge that this is a Olympic level sport and this is like a, not Olympic level sport? That, and that's right. And there's many sports and there's much recognition and there's all sorts of requirements that go around it. Um, when Joe DeSena came up with the idea uh, or the proposal of taking, now he said take Spartan Race to the Olympics. Structurally, that's not a possibility because you can't take a brand to the Olympics. Yeah. You can't be, you can't <laughs> be a brand. You can't do it. Right. Um, there's, no, there's no system structure or route to do that. Right. The sport is different. That's why you need take things from being an activity, like a, a, a grouping of people doing a lot of stuff, which is what obstacle course racing arguably is, and then putting structure around it so that it is a sport. Now, that's a complicated thing in and of itself, and it takes most activities decades or even centuries to, to get to that point. Yeah. Um, we, we've gone about it a slightly different way. When I say we, is that for, I worked with Joe for a year, a full year on figuring out if it was possible to take Spartan Race to the Olympics? Answer being no. Um, but if you create the sport, then you it is possible to get the sport recognized. And the sport is inclusive of 
everything, yep. meaning all the brands, all the advertisers, all the supporters, all the parties of interest, whether that's uh, training, safety, medical, it goes on and on and on, right? Yeah. Sport is big. Um, if you can put all that together and you do have a sport, inclusive of all the brands, the tide rises rapidly, which, of course, floats all the boats. So yep. everyone everyone benefits. Yep. Everything gets cheaper, more accessible. There's more media around it like this. These kind of discussions are part of that media thing. Yeah. And eventually done right, if a sport can be created and then get recognized, um, it has a shot potentially at getting a medal event at a, an Olympic Games. That's always a possibility out there somewhere. Yeah. And if you do that, then you're on a really big platform, so then you've got 5 billion people watching you. Yeah. And that drives money, which drives prices down and makes them more accessible. Yeah, and I think it also just adds a legitimacy where it encourages more and more high schoolers, middle schoolers to have like an obstacle course racing program, right? Like I played tennis growing up and there's a tennis program at my high school, right? Like Pete Sampras's championship plaque is on my high school tennis court wall. And it's like, oh, like this is like legitimate use of, you know, a, a kid's time. And like, yeah, why why not obstacle course racing, right? And I think you can make a similar argument perhaps with like esports, right? Like th- like gaming is is exploding whether that's going to be a sport or looks more like a chess. I think there's some discussion and nuance there. Uh, and we can talk about that. But I actually want to talk about your personal story. I know that you've been involved personally as an adventure racer yourself for for years, decades, right? How did you get into the sport? Uh, I got in through friends. It was kind of car crash curiosity for me. I was uh, supporting friends. It was 1984. Yeah. Uh, I had some friends. They were Olympians, actually, in uh, single sports, like uh, Nordic skiing. So they're very good athletes. Uh, they were doing, uh, back in the day, called it was called multi-sport. Um, it, it got changed to adventure racing as the common lexicon for describing the sport. But back in the day, we were doing this multi-sport thing, yeah. which was really, for lack of other words, it's kind of wilderness obstacle course racing. And that had been, in the modern era, had been, really started kicked or it kicked around in the 70s 1970s and started getting formalized right around 1979 1980 um so i got involved quite early okay. but as a support crew so there was sort of complex still to this day in the adventure world the wilderness side the sort of complex and they requiring a lot of stuff so this particular event was called wild trek in australia in the southern alps which there is, believe it or not, uh, snowy Alps in Australia. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, so is it, it was Alps in there. Europe? Okay. This, I guess yep. <laughs> the Alp mountain range extends onto Australia. There is, uh, There are what they call the Southern Alps, okay. which is odd. They're not very big, but they're, they get snow. <laughs> so okay. Nordic, we started Nordic skiing, yeah. uh, orienteering, running, um, not quite mountain biking in, the days. in those days. We used cross bikes. We didn't really have mountain bikes of any sort. Uh, and then into wild water kayaking. And it was a two-day event. Uh, with map and compass, and that was you know, the obstacles being natural terrain, mountains, rivers, cliffs, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that was my introduction, and I was supporting uh, my friends, and they said, and I was looking at going, you know, three ways crazy. I don't think I will have any interest in doing that. And they said, well, you should just try it once. So next year, of course, I, there I am signed up at the start line. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time I got to the finish of it, um, and I was 20, so, you know, I, I was doing triathlons and ultra distance kayaking things, but nothing compared. It was so hard. To this day, it was the hardest single big, like big thing that I'd done in one hit, yeah. going up from doing something that might be like 10 hours long to 30 hours long is a big jump. Yeah. And very intense because the legs are relatively short. Yeah. And of course, I'm getting toward the finish. I'm thinking, this is absolutely, this is foolish. I don't know why anyone would do this. And I'm <laughs> definitely not going to do it again. Because they hand you a beer at the finish line and then yeah. you drink your beer and you go, that was great. Oh, that was great. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. That was so awesome. All over. Get, yeah. the, get the beer and that's all over. So I've stuck with it for uh, 20 some years. That actually is one of the, brings up an audience question. Um, someone was actually curious about the nighttime adventure. I mean, if you're doing an obstacle course race for 30 hours, you're you're going through the night. Uh, how can you see? Is it safe? Do you have a compass? I mean, how does it all work when, when you're in the pitch black darkness? Well, you, you have lights. Back in those days, they were not good. Um, you know, it'd be a flashlight with a bulb that would burn out and double, a, and double D batteries or something. Yeah. Uh, these days, it's much, uh, it's much, much easier. And the technology has evolved with LEDs and lithium batteries to the point where it's it's almost trivial. Right. Uh, it's very common too. You've got world's toughest mudder. 
and you've got the Spartan uh, Ultra, and these are nighttime races. So they go through the night, and the athletes are doing exactly what we were doing, just with equipment that is one-third the weight or one-quarter right. the weight. Uh, we would actually carry, for longer races, we'd carry motorbike batteries. Huh. Um, and the, motor, <laughs> the motorbike batteries would then, we then had these little kind of motorbike headlamps. Yeah. And the motorbike batteries are really heavy, so we would, you know, we'd have to schlep these things around to keep light all night. Yeah. Of course, you can do that now in the size of your pen. Right. Interesting. So to hopefully maybe answer some of the confusion, because, you know, when I did the Spartan race in the stadium, it was like a, I don't know, maybe like a five mile run around the stadium. I think people were finishing in an hour, an hour and a half. So those are on the relatively short side of an adventure obstacle course race. And it sounds like there are, you know, multi-day ones. You know, what are the longest adventure course races that you guys have you know, that you guys know about or are aware of or are involved with? Well, it's probably worth going from this, the shorter stuff. Yeah. So we've formalized now uh, what we call Ninja OCR. So people are familiar with Ninja Warrior yep. on television and probably now uh, Ninja vs. Ninja. So if you look at Ninja vs. Ninja, you actually, what you're seeing is head-to-head racing that can be put in a bracket format. Yep. Uh, and we actually have a rig with a partner down in Los Angeles who is a partner on the TV shows. Uh, that is a competition rig, and we'll be rolling the rig out pretty soon. Mm. 100 meters, all obstacles, very fast. You can do it in about a minute if you're very, very quick. Uh, achievable for most people. So if you like Ninja Warrior and you go, I want to do that, that's your chance. Um, and then that gives the ability to have you know, quite a large number of people uh, go through these things. Right now we have two lanes, but the, the goal is to have eight, just like you have in a swimming pool or a running track. Oh. And then you've got eight people head to head, just like the hundred meters, right? Except now they're <laughs> That'd on be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Super fun. Straight to watch. And then you've got track. So now you're talking about multiples of, you know, around a running track, yeah. 400 meters, 800 meters, or 600. We did a 600 a couple of years back um, in Dallas and just trialing it, but it worked out really well. And then to what people, most people do and understand. So now we're looking at basically cross country, the standard kind of distances. They say we've got sprints about 3K, short course about 5K. Um, middle distance about 10 um, and it kind of goes and then long course and kind of goes up from there and these are fairly well established distances that a lot of events are doing right now and championship races okay yeah. we have our european champs coming up um, in a few weeks in denmark and that'll have sprint um, mixed relay uh, on the sprint distance uh, and then um, standard distance of basically a 15k yeah uh, and that's a championship race so you'll see that established throughout the federations, which we never really talked about, but the sport requires uh, representation by the athletes. And it starts at the federation level. I'll get back to that in a minute. But So the distance can keep going up. Yeah. And now the, stand, the well-established ones, 24 hours, World's Toughest Mudder really established that. Um, and that's been copied now a few times. Uh, and then you've got uh, ultra-distance events. So I guess the Spartan Ultra Beast would be a fairly good example as we're starting to get over Technically, it's 42 kilometers, right? 26.2 miles, mm-hmm. 42.2 kilometers. So that's technically an ultra. Um, and then anything over that, I think Spartan takes it also to another level with their agogi. So they're just getting longer and longer. And then the last distance or distances we have now kind of integrated back to kind of full circle tying the loop together is uh, expedition. So expedition OCR is really what we would have called back in the day, multi-sport, or more recently in like, well, the 90s, then yeah. became adventure racing. And there's an interesting thing with adventure racing because we were he- doing full-on obstacle races. We called them sprints, but they were basically obstacle races with obstacles exactly the same as you'd see today. Huh. You know, rope climbs, cargo nets, A-frames, exactly the same things. And this started in the mid-90s. Right. There were full-on national series with um, national championships with television coverage and it was people, most people doing OCR don't even remember them now yeah. because it was, you know, that was, they made, they probably weren't born <laughs> <laughs> and it was television. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of the, uh, extended endurance ones just sound so primal. I think I, I remember Joe was telling me about death race, which was like, it, it was like the most extreme version where I think like you were climbing like a mer or, or not climbing. Or like, yeah, you were like climbing rope for like 26 miles or something. Like some absurd challenge. It's like, man, these are beasts of human beings to be able to like climb a marathon or like crawl a marathon and then run a marathon. It's like, whoa, there's some crazy humans out there. 
Yeah, and, and on the expedition, talking about long and crazy, yeah. the expedition events, we used to do very, very long ones, um, a yeah. thousand kilometers. Wow. So that would be about a 10 day race wow. uh, for the winners. So they were, they were quite long. These days, they tend to settle out at about between 250 and 400 miles, depending yeah. on the terrain. Because the obstacles now are big. You're talking yeah. about some of that peak, uh, across that lake or ocean. They're the big obstacles yeah. that you see in natural terrain. Um, and it has this whole other level of complexity that makes it quite inaccessible for most people. Right. Whereas an obstacle course race, you could probably do naked. You don't need yeah. anything. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to get off of work for a couple of weeks. I mean, it's not going to be like an Olympic sport in any time soon to like, oh, no. all right, do two weeks. <laughs> That's going to be as long as the whole Olympics itself, right? Like Pretty run right. across the continent. The <laughs> yeah, which, which could, could be cool. Like literally the the first event is this extended adventure race and the last and the last meddling ceremony is this meddling, right? Because like the, it, it's interesting, the marathon is like the last um, event in, in, the, in the Olympics, which is kind of like a nice closing touch but you can imagine in some weird absurd universe that the there's some event that takes the extent of the entire olympic two weeks or three weeks that the olympics are going that would be kind of that would be kind, that'd be kind of funny the uh we have the first formalized expedition ocr world championships this year okay it's uh september 6th through the 12th up in british columbia okay so it's a it's a well-established event company that's been doing it since 2001 yeah um, so it's been around for a very long time. Something else that happened just last week was the Eco Challenge announced they're coming back in 2019. Yes, that's actually one of the uh, questions someone asked about the Eco Challenge and Bear Grylls. Uh, can, yeah, can you talk about that and explain that for our audience? Well, I can't talk about it much. Okay. <laughs> um, at this our, point, there's some logistical and, and and corporate and financial things that have to be done, yeah. but the announcement's been made. So the original team from um, the Eco Challenge is back producing, and they, that's Mark Burnett Productions. So mo- a lot of people know Mark Burnett from Survivor. Well, these days he's head of MGM Studios, but okay. he was he produced the Eco Challenge and then Survivor and The yep. Apprentice and on yep. and on, kind of created reality television. Um, so he's a very well known, extremely savvy uh, producer of events and shows, as people probably recognise because they switch their TV on. They're probably watching a Mark Burnett show a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the event formats expedition, it's or adventure racing, whatever you want to call it. It's right. a long, uh, difficult wilderness, deep wilderness, navigation, stressful stuff that creates great television. Yeah. I can imagine that some of your best athletes, there are going to be ex special ops. I mean, that's what that sounds like. I mean, that's what they do, right? That's how they train literally like here, take a backpack, 80 pounds and like walk across a mountain. And you would then, think so. You would, you would think, think so. so. Okay. But that's, that's not how it planned out. Though. Really? So who in are the, the who are their best athletes? Are, where do they come from? Are these all, uh, triathletes? Like, who are you pulling uh, talent from? Well, when when I was racing, so we were ultimately we were Team Nike. Okay. And we were almost undefeated over about twenty years hmm. of racing, and that's multiple races a year. And, but that's really a squad. We were a professional team, and we were full on professionals. And we quickly figured out. Um, that we needed people who could win no matter what. Uh, and that ended up being world champions. So we would pull world champions in all sorts of sports. We had world champions in mountain biking, road cycling, orienteering, triathlon, biathlon, skiing, you name it. We had world champions who knew how to win. Yeah. And, that, and then we groomed and trained them basically uh, to be strong in everything because you can't have one person weak in one thing. It just doesn't work. And people would think, oh, we need a navigator. Yeah. Well, you, no, actually, you need four navigators if you've got four people because right. you're going to get really tired at some point and you're not always thinking straight and you need people backing you up. And, and it's the same for everything. Yeah. Uh, the goal was for every single person on our teams to be able to compete at a world championships in a single sport, meaning if you could go to the world mountain bike champs and actually qualify, you made the grade. If you, but you also had to do that in name a sport, you know, yeah. kayaking, um, uh, the multi sports. Uh, in, the, in the peak of racing, you're probably going to see the same thing emerge is it's going to be the same people who are just absolutely extraordinary athletes, ex-Olympians, world champions. And that's, that was driven by money. And I think that'll happen again. Yeah. Um, you know, prize money is a big attractor for competitive, successful people and they yeah. like to win. Yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, I think a lot of soldiers would describe themselves as like heavy duty trucks where athletes are like for fine tuned Ferraris. Right. I mean, 
So I, I, I can I can understand if you're pulling from world champion level athletes that are just professionally training just for you know adventure racing and expedition, you'll do pretty well against military. I can you see, see that. you see it in OCR already. You're yeah. actually seeing uh, people who are, are winning consistently now at the top level of OCR. We've got uh, Olympic medalists, yeah, um, a lot of Nordic ski people, uh, professional runners who compete at a very high level and can win in a single sport. Like uh, John Oldman is, uh, he's a world class runner. Yeah, uh, Lindsay Webster is, um, you know, she's a world class Nordic skier. All right. Um, and Zuana Kukumova from um, Eastern Europe, she's also, she was actually an Olympic medalist. Mm. So you're talking, now we're starting to see some extraordinary athletes emerge. And yeah. you can see the difference because there's, there's a big space between the top level right now uh, and then even the next, you know, the second top 10, if you like, they're, they're not quite as close. Yeah. <laughs> Big spread I mean, after the top 10 yeah. or even the top five. Which happens in most distributions across any discipline, right? There just ends up being a Pareto rule where the best of the best are, you know, just exponentially better than everyone else. And you have a big clumping towards the tail, right? Like this long tail. So yeah, I uh, think it's, a, yeah. it's probably a bell curve. Yeah. But, and you're exactly right. We look at the, the end of the curve yeah. and kind of, and that's the, to me, that's the, that's kind of inspirational, maybe aspirational for some people who are yeah. good enough. And then, Everyone else is perspirational, which is kind of the goal. Yeah. So Lizzie uh, wrote in from an email ask, and wanted to ask you, uh, especially for obstacle course racing, what are your best or favorite recovery practices? Um, this might be just consistent with like standard best care, but I, I'm curious if anything that you picked up that's specific towards the types of movements that an obstacle course race would entail. Well, for recovery, we're really talking about um, sleep. Okay. As much as anything else, yeah. uh, so you go through phases after uh, stressing your body. The the goal for workout is to stress yourself enough so that you you supercompensate, meaning you you overcompensate a little bit from the the stress and get a little bit stronger. So you can you can look at it in several ways. If you don't stress hard enough, so you just kind of go out for an easy something, you're not stressing enough to get um, a, a super compensation, meaning more than just recover back to where you were. Right. So you need to stress pretty hard. Uh, but not so much that you get so much damage that you can't recover. So that's right. the other mistake. That's overtraining, right? So the trick is train hard enough so you know it's stressful, but then allow enough uh, time uh, to recover fully and repair. So the key is repair. People don't often appreciate that. Now repair is generally with the release of human growth hormone. So you're going to you need that hormone to repair right. and grow. Yes, yeah, so that's why it's called growth hormone. Yeah. Uh, that's released mostly when you sleep. Yep. Which is a paradox because if you work out hard, you often can't sleep. Yep. Because you're, everything's elevated. You've got your metabolisms up and your heart rate. I mean, it's actually difficult to sleep. Yeah. Uh, however, having said that, I think for most people in a regular life uh, where you've got work, family, all this kind of stuff, set aside a day, a week, maybe a Sunday. Say, this is my day. This is where I get to train properly and I get to recover properly. Part of that's hydration, nutrition. So you've got to, you've got to have full, um, ability to fuel your body with the nutrients and the calories to repair. Yeah. So that long, hard, fun, real cut, which is quite often a race on a weekend. That's probably the hardest thing. Do the race, then have that really good, solid sleep afterwards uh, with the nutrition and full hydration beforehand so that you're not in deficit when you go to sleep. Yeah. Any specific diets that you're experimenting with? Uh, you know, I, I know, ketogenic diets are fairly popular recently. Uh, any specific devices? You know, I'm wearing a heart rate variability tracking ring right now, uh, which is an interesting sleep tracker to tell how recovered I am perhaps after, you know, uh, a night of sleeping. Any, any, I mean, I think what you say is like generally good advice. I think, I think it's absolutely right. I think it's very hard to find that edge. And I think that's in a lot of my conversations with athletes and coaches. How do you make sure that people are like, oh, like training very, very hard on the hard days and then taking the easy days or recovery days really well? And it sounds like most people find this issue where they're not going hard enough on the hard days and getting too hard on the easy days. You're not getting uh, any of the you know overcompensation, supercompensation. You're not getting enough recovery. I think it's very hard. So some of the response has been, okay, let's look at devices or biomarkers. Um, what are your thoughts there? Have you experimented with some of that yourself? Well, I was fortunate to be in the medical space for a very, very long time. It's actually my formal training. Okay. I was biomedical engineering and sports medicine. So that I've used that. Uh, I use that as an athlete. <laughs> just following the biology yeah. to understand recovery, rest, recovery, sleep, 
um, repair, all that kind of stuff. The, my observation teaching it to physicians or teaching uh, injury prevention um, and avoidance is that most people, uh, they don't train with a low enough heart rate is one. And if you look at an obstacle course race, at least 80% of it is running. Yeah. Now, a lot of people do it. They don't really appreciate the running part, but that's probably what it is, is running with some obstacles in it, right? Yeah. No obstacles that, that's basically what I realized when I was doing <laughs> the Spartan race. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just running three miles today, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, consequently, people, don't, people think that if they're not really stressed, they don't feel stressed, they're not train, training hard enough, and it's absolutely wrong. Um, every professional that I, successful professional I've met has been successful over time, and I'm talking my peers, really, like Paul and Newby Fraser and Dave Allen and uh, Dave, uh, Dave Scott and Mark Allen, those guys who won consistently over time, over decades. Uh, and my peers as well in the adventure racing space is that knowing how to train slow is really important. It's a very, very low risk way to train with a very high gain. Intensity is extremely high risk with very low gain. Right, and the reality is, you have to have a big aerobic development to support everything. Right, are you, you wearing a heart do... rate tracker? Are you tracking to be under the aerobic threshold or anaerobic threshold, or, um, or is this intuitive now? It's for you. Uh, for me, it's intuitive. But okay. you know, I did have heart, I used heart rate monitors back in the day. Okay. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it's a really good tool, right. mostly to see that their their heart rate is low enough. It really means you're you're fully aerobic. So that right. you're so what are you targeting? Like 140, 150 BPM. Very simple. Well, very. It's age based. Um, right, right, right. So, so the very, rule of thumb is one hundred and eighty minus the number of years that you are. Right, is that's the right. One hundred and eighty minus your age. It's a very good rule of thumb. Right. For most people, it's a safe thing to do. No matter how good you are, it's still safe. Mm -hmm. um, well, highly tuned athletes know how to go to the edge of that and maintain it. Or yeah, I mean, you, I you would basically yeah, use like an RQ, you would actually go into a lab and actually measure the ac exact threshold, right? We do a VO2 max test, you know, re respiratory quotient test to actually see when your fat metabolism switches into glucose metabolism. So you can actually do that. If, like if you want to be a professional, go into a lab. But yeah, I think the uh, 180 minus the age is a good rule of thumb. Well, that's, an, uh, that's another thing. So you just delved into nutrition, actually yeah. fuel, yeah. which delves into nutrition. So yeah. fuel becomes really interesting and For longer races. ketogenic yeah a ketogenic state everyone's in a ketogenic state most of the time for whether they know it or not um and or, it's not, or, it's, or a fat metabolizing state fat metabolizing state that's right. correct yeah right. fat metabolizing state. this which is distinct from ketogenic state it, it, that's correct I, I this is where we can get really into the nuances <laughs> yes. of it or the stuff that actually matters yeah for most people the bottom line is when you're lying in bed asleep you're burning fat correct and you're probably nibbling through your glycogen, but you're really burning fat because your heart rate is low and it's easy to metabolize your fat. So you have high level of um, mobilization of free fatty acids is what it's actually called. And now you're just kind of ticking along in your fat burning zone. Now, the goal as a good endurance athlete is you want to be in there as much as possible, no matter what you're doing. And that's a training effect and a dietary effect. Yeah. Um, and more recently, as, uh, as I just learned because of you guys, is there's also... Um, you can also take an oral nutrient, which does the same thing. Yeah, and that's remarkable to me. I mean, I love this kind of stuff as it's biology. Yeah, um, and then of course you want to put into practice. But these <laughs> things, this kind of gives you the shortcut of how do you get there um, if you uh, don't have the time, or you want to kick kickstart your system, or whatever the reason is. But you really want to get to that ability to have a fairly high output, so sub threshold. Many you're you're fully aerobic, you can hold a conversation aerobic. That's right. what it is. Um, basic, here's a basic rule 180 minus your age, that's a good one. Or can you say a complete sentence while you're exercising? Because if you can't, you're out of breath. Yeah. And if you're out of breath, you're going anaerobic. And if you're going anaerobic, you're not in your fat burning zone. So it's a very simple thing. Just be able to say complete sentences while you're exercising and you're good. Yeah. And what that does is it trains your body to access your stored fat while you're exercising, which leads to another thing about nutrition what do you eat when you compete? Um, you really don't need to, excuse me, you don't need to eat anything much at all if you're well trained. Right. If you're habituated to, to doing what the nutrition companies typically tell you to do, eat a bunch of sugar packets, eat sugar before you race, <laughs> and then you have to eat it while you race. Right. And then while, if you do it while you race, you still have to eat it more you race, while you right. race because you go into that constant hyper hypoglycemic cycle, which is very difficult to break. Right. And, and it's a disaster because as you exercise, you're delivering them 
blood away from your digestive tract into your working muscles and you actually can't digest anything anyway. So you get the kind of typical Iron Man Gatorade belly where I have to have this gel at exactly this time and then drink this and they get the Gatorade belly because they're not absorbing anything. They're just right. creating a basketball of fluid in their stomach which they throw up and then they do it again year after year, which is remarkable in yeah. itself. Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting areas that we've just learned a lot about the GI distress. I mean, when you're doing Iron Man's or you know twenty hour, you know thirty hour race, I'm sure that can, yeah, nutrition is like the third sport or the fourth part of the sport uh, 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 of of that of that race, right? Like, I mean, especially doing a thirty hour race, I'm I'm sure you're fueling at a th- doing a thirty hour races. Like I think yeah, if you're doing like a four hour race, you probably don't need a fuel, especially if you're a fat adapted. But if you're doing a 30 hour race, you probably want to be fueling. It varies. It varies okay. per person. I'm pretty well fat adapted. So for me, even these days at four hours and I'm pretty good. Okay. Uh, it, it, kind of, it goes into the fasting thing too, because fasting apart from being very good for you yeah. um, is training your body to be fat adapted. Yeah. Because if you're fasting, what are you burning? Fat. You're burning your own fat. That's yeah. it. That's what you have. So having that fasting state for a while each day is quite good for you and is great for your training do you fast because it is training i mean how often do you fast or what's your fasting protocol well um so only recently it's been a conscious thing but my habit has always been i don't really like breakfast so from my preference be an early-ish dinner and then i probably wouldn't be hungry till midday early afternoon that's my habit and that's what i tend to feel is good for me, I, I can try and eat. I'll, I'll eat sometimes early in the morning or in the morning at some point, and it's not comfortable. Yeah, might be delicious, but they're different things. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I don't crave food at all. Which, which puts that, let's say, at six p.m. to midday. So it's an eighteen-hour daily okay. fast. And I think anything twelve to eighteen is probably quite good. Yeah. The more you can push it with comfort, and it was progressive. So if you do it and decide, okay, I'm going to go for twelve, and I'm just going to add an hour a week. Six weeks later, you're up to 18, you're good. Yep. Now, that's interesting. I mean, I have a, uh, I eat a daily 16, 8, so 16 hour fast, uh, fasting window. And I usually do a 24 or 36 hour fast weekly. And I think exactly to your point, you're just training your body to be metabolically flexible, right? Yep. When you have carbs, you burn carbs. But when you uh, don't have availability of, 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 of a lot of, you know, glucose flow, you can actually switch into a fat burning state, which is essentially, yeah, we're just training your body to be flexible. Absolutely. It's what, it's what the evolutionary human did. Yeah. The evolutionary human did not have grocery stores or access to, or even agriculture. Yeah. So it was a different, and that's several hundred thousand years. Yeah. You know, minimum a hundred thousand years of, of human evolution until agriculture. So for that 95,000 years, what did humans do? Yeah. Well, they certainly didn't go to the store and they definitely <laughs> didn't, I mean, none of that existed. So what, that do, they were doing exactly what you described. Yeah. That's yeah, what I mean, we could talk designed. all about intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet, all of that stuff. I mean, that's in my wheelhouse, but I want to focus on obstacle course racing. And we actually have an audience question. Uh, Uncharted Fish asks, how did you personally approach obstacle course races? I mean, I guess that's an interesting question because if I'm gearing up for a 30-hour race, I mean, I've never done that before. I, I what What is it like the day before? Are you stressed out? Are you sleeping well? Because you know you're going to you know, basically exert yourself uh, very heavily for the next day and a half. What, what's going through your head as you're preparing for the race? And then what do you think about when you're just like busting butt for 30 hours straight? Mental preparation um, is tr- is a training effect too. So being able to uh, put yourself in the, in the appropriate um, frame of mind is quite important. Sleeping before race is quite hard. I think anyone, I'd be surprised if anyone or many people sleep before races very well yeah. so i always regard that as a that's a kind of a wasted night or one that you you get something if you can which is fine because you can operate quite effectively and you're just resting you're not sleeping you sure you're resting but most people at least be horizontal with their eyes closed uh, which is fine but getting to the start, start line and then it really gets down to what i believe is uh, race strategy and race strategy means don't go too fast too soon um, and almost everyone does and my habit even as a professional with our team was to um, walk off the back of the start. Very common that we would stand behind the start, behind the field, let them go. You're not going to win the race in the first 100 meters or kilometer or mile, even five miles or 10 miles if it's a really long race. It happens later if you pace yourself properly. 
So that means start slow, don't slow down. Ideally, speed up a little bit. So negative splitting is a typically a pretty quick race. Yeah. And that's mentally difficult to do. Yeah. That's you know, pre- preparing yourself uh, to be able to do it and understanding and having the um, knowledge that it's stressful to be behind. It's stressful to be behind the field and it's stressful to, but it's not stressful to catch people and pass them. So if you can get, if you can get yourself in that mindset, you're good. Yeah. It's very difficult to do. I mean, you see in the pros, they'll lay just wrap it off the front. Some, the very top level might be able to hold it and, and on for the win. That's possible. Um, but not common. It's possible. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's always interesting to talk to professional athletes who, you know, what is, like, I, I guess I was talking to an ultra marathoner, you know, who runs 10 hour, you know, 100 milers. You know, what I asked them, what is, what do you think about? I mean, what are you thinking in a 30 hour competition? I mean, <laughs> I, I know when I'm doing longer runs, I'm training for a half marathon, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, you know, in your own head, not listening to music. I know personally, I just like think through, you know, you know, the, the business, you know, my relationships with people to think about my technique, don't get too tired, uh, you know, don't think, you know, think about keeping the hips loose. I mean, what are you thinking about? Well, um, I guess let's put it in the context of racing. When I was competitive in my race, and I yeah. trained. Uh, every movement was for absolute maximum efficiency. Mm-hmm. Every single nuance of every movement. So it would be every step, every like every single thing we look, I was looking at, we were looking at would be because races can come down to seconds. Even over seven days, it was not uncommon to have a sprint for the finish. And you, and th- at that point, as you sprint for the finish, you're thinking about the seconds or minutes you wasted somewhere else in the course. Yeah. So you never want to get to that point where you go, oh, crap, I just, you know, I shouldn't have done that. I should have just like taken that line a little better. Right. And that's, that's the nuance of racing, I think, at the top level, or even for yourself, just to maximize, to know that you did the best you could do. Which is really, to me, what race. So you're on point for 30 hours straight. You are thinking about your movement. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, in, in, um, in the really long races, days or weeks, it's even more important. Yeah. So you start, if you're dipping your paddle for 100 kilometers a time in your canoe, you think about the, like, the precision of that movement because over a million strokes, it adds up. Yeah. If you're a little sloppy every stroke for a million strokes, that's a lot of, that's a lot of waste. Yeah. So don't waste anything. That's a good kick in the butt for me. I'm going to try to be more intentional with my movement when I next run. I mean, like, well, it, you're de- just, it depends. But, but I want, you know, I, I think it's like, you know, I think I'm cut from a smaller cloth. If I'm going to do something, might as well train and do it well. And it sounds like if you can maintain focus for 30 hours straight, like I, oftentimes if I'm just running in the morning, like I'm not trying to win a race. I'm not like racing. I'm just like trying to get, you know, 90 minutes, you know, of, of running in. Um, that's, you know, maybe perhaps if you, like, if you just train intentionally with and think about the movement and try to just bring yourself to the movement and not get distracted, that might be able to help you train more efficiently, train I more intentionally. I think it depends on your goals. Yeah. Because it doesn't, I mean, that's for efficiency and yeah. speed and you know, doing the best you can, but the, everyone has a different reason. Sometimes yeah. it might just be because you want to think about work or you want to zone out and just clear your head for something else. In those cases, it's completely the opposite, right? You don't want to think about what you're doing. Fair enough. Yeah. Then you're, then you just, you go out in a trail that you know you can't get less lost on and you, you make it back to the start and you kind of wonder how you got there and you go, that was great. <laughs> kind of cleared the mind. And yeah. So they're, they're different, different reasons. So, um, training and racing with purpose, but whatever, what that purpose is, is up to the individual. Yeah. And I think most people, the, the meat of the bell curve for uh, most of these uh, races, they're not. I don't think people even would care to have that precision in movement the entire way. Yeah, well said. There's certainly people who would, for yeah. sure. Uh, and then there's other people who just want to get a beer at the end. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's definitely, I, I know in our audience, I think a lot of us would want to just, hey, if we're doing this, you might as well just do it right. And I think I think it's a good goal to aspire towards. Um, Disco Disco 14 asks, uh, you've been a part of a good amount of TV shows based on all the obstacle race shows that are out there. Um, I'm not sure how much experience you have, but if you have some experience, what is it like behind the curtains in some of these, you know, American Ninja or Ninja Warrior? Um, how does sport and media intertwine? 
uh, this is someone who his background is or her background is someone who's just curious about both sport and media. Uh, it depends on the show. Um, so that is correct. Yes, I've, I've had a pretty good career that uh, switched over fairly early in my racing career into event and television production. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I stayed with that subsequently. So that's a couple, about 20 years now. Uh, the shows vary a lot. And if it's a pure sport show, like you're shooting the 100 meters in the Olympics, that's a race. Uh, most of the, well, all the Olympic stuff are uh, competitions at a very high level. That's one style of capturing uh, the images and the story for broadcast. And, and that's a world away from on the other end of competition that's broadcast. You're looking at reality shows. And then in the middle, there, there's something is where you get things like obstacle course racing and American Ninja Warrior. Actually, that's a pretty good example. Right. So American Ninja Warrior is pretty well known. A lot of people see it. They understand it. Uh, it is a real competition with very good athletes doing amazing things on incredible rigs. They're real athletes. It's kind of, I mean, I look at them, I'm kind of ooing and ahhing and going, this is unbelievable. Yeah. These guys are incredible, which they are. Yeah. Uh, but there's also an element, uh, a big element of production involved. And production meaning the shows are produced, so they're very carefully crafted to capture the best story for the show, whatever that is. Right. In American Ninja Warrior, obviously it's a competition, someone wins. Um, but there's also the crash and burns, the splashing and the, the bumps and the scrapes and the failures and the slips, and, and that's part of the story. And the nature of the events are that will happen, and that's obstacle course racing very accurately described, is that everyone going out on the course, whether they're the, the top athlete in the world, whether it's name some athletes, Rhea Coble, Faye Stenning, Lindsay Webster and the females, they're, you know, they're, they're battling it out, and they know they can slip. They could slip on a rope. They could miss a spear throw. They could drop drop a weight. They could. I mean, there's all sorts of things that can happen, and that makes for interesting uh, television, and makes for good stories, especially when it gets tight. And then this person won on this race, and that person won on the next race, and it just goes on and on. Yeah. So the shows run the gamut of pure sport to something fully produced, or even just reality, which in a lot of cases is completely manufactured. Right. Uh, for the purposes of, of obstacle course racing, they mostly race with some great stories because the very nature of the sport uh, lends itself to this really crazy stuff happening, which is exciting and fun. And we know that as athletes, right? You get into the course and it's always something unexpected. Yeah. It's great. Do you have a personal scary story or a most memorable story you can share? Oh, good grief. Uh, I'm sure you have <laughs> many. Race. Yeah, I'm sure you have many, but I just, <laughs> just want to highlight you know, one, one, one story here. All right, I'll, I'll, describe, I'll describe one of the races we did, which was just a... Uh, Oh, it was an absolute cracker. This thing was crazy. We, uh, it was the Ray Gawaz in 1998. And um, we started at the head of the Amazon uh, in Ecuador, uh, climbed out of the Amazon basin up to the Valley of the Volcanoes, which is this ring of live volcanoes, uh, and then summited Mount Cotopaxi, which is the world's highest active volcano. It's 20,000 feet, effectively. I think it's 19,730 feet or something. Um, and it has a kind of ice cream cone on the top of ice. So it kind of looks like an ice cream cone, right? Except that that ice cream cone is <laughs> solid, slick ice because the volcano is hot and the snow is cold, yeah. and about a thousand feet of it at the top of this twenty thousand foot volcano. And most people, if they summit, if they can summit Cotopaxi, which um, is not the rule, but if you can do it, it's going to take you about three weeks. So we did okay. seventeen hours. Uh, and then we continued down the Pacific coast, and, and no altitude sickness or acclimatization. Oh yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, pretty so bad you were kind of so you just powered through up and it, down. Right? Okay, yeah, up and down. Yeah, Oof. it was pretty bad. It yeah. was uh, it was incredibly memorable. Um, so that's <laughs> what uh, that was. And then down the Pacific coast, it was it was seven, it was a ten day race, and it was a, it was almost a sprint to the finish with the the top teams. So we <laughs> we won. Fortunately, um, that was just crazy. <laughs> this sounds fun i mean i think like me a year ago would have been like you guys are just crazy what are you talking about or, you guys are nuts but i i think just getting to you know you, you speaking fo- with like folks like yourself i mean i think it just sounds like of an adventure it sounds fun yeah it was i mean it's why i called adventure racing it was yeah. i called it paid to play it was yeah. stressful and it was hard and we we got to the point where we looked forward to the suffering yeah um, i think that's necessary to really enjoy the sport, you have to like suffering at some yeah. level. So I think that is 
that's kind of we all do right you go into a i think i think everyone likes to accomplish a challenge i don't know if people like suffering but i think everyone i i I don't know if everyone would say they like suffering but i would say that everyone likes accomplishing a challenge i think everyone likes the effect of it so think of your first tough matter right you probably know what to expect right you go into the event and it's 10 miles you go oh and you kind of realize you haven't run ever 10 miles ever yeah and you got to do all this other stuff and you climb a mountain on the way through and you go, oh my gosh, that was, and the time you're just hurting like crazy. All right. But the, the net experience is exceptional. Yeah. The harder it is, the better it gets or the better it was. I guess yeah. is the, the stock phrase. The harder yeah. it is, the better it was. Something like that. And that's, yeah. that actually describes human nature too. I hope so. Also the addictive I hope quality. so. I, I, which I hope so. I think there are certain people that are wired that way. And I, I hope that it's really everyone that's wired that way. And perhaps the culture around the society around us has made us a little bit soft, right? I think most people are very coddled. And I hope, you know, something like, you know, the sport that you're creating can encourage people to get out there and challenge themselves. At least that's my hope with, you know, the work that we do. Can we push people to be better versions of themselves? So I want to talk, if it's okay, I want to talk yeah. briefly about what the sport is. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about kind of the events. The, yeah. the reality is the sport is, it's, it's a federative system, and that's democratic. And it's federative because the representation is, we call it by and for the athletes. Mm-hmm. The members of the international federation are the national federations. The members of the national federations are the athletes. The athletes run everything mm-hmm. from the bottom up. So national federations only exist because of the body of athletes in that country that uh, are on everything in the federation in the country, and they're they're nonprofits. Um, everyone, it's all volunteer run. Sometimes they employ a, a small paid staff to run stuff, and then they are the members of the international federation. Um, so the members are ultimately still 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 representing the athletes. It's representing for the athletes, for and by the athletes. A lot of people don't understand that. Mm-hmm. They'll look at me and they say, "Oh, you start. What makes you the president of something?" Well. If you start your own company or organization of any form, the first person who starts it kind of has to run it. There's, right. there's only one person to start with. Um, it was Joe DeSena's idea, but you know, within a year, it, was, it couldn't be his organization. So it had to be formed properly, which is a nonprofit. Now we're actually found where a nonprofit under Swiss law in Switzerland, because that's what we really have to do as a sporting organization. It's the right place and the right laws and all that kind of stuff. So we're a Swiss nonprofit. And we're a federative organization representing athletes through the national federations and then providing them the benefits of, uh, as we put it all together. And that's a, that's a long way of saying, look, it's, it's about the athletes. It's about you guys yeah. and girls. If you want to be involved, it's yours. It's for you. It's by you. You get to vote. You get to represent. You, if you get an interest in running stuff, you get to do that. Very simple system. Uh, very effective. Um, and to start off with, there's no money at all, which people start going, Pay us some money. If you're the federation, pay us money. You go, all right. Well, when we make some, that would be great. We would love to, which yeah. is also something that we're, you know, in time, it does get to be to that point. But you, you then ask the obvious question, well, where do federations get money? And most don't have any money, actually. They are just kind of a bunch of volunteers putting sweat labor, sweat equity in. And that's what happens right now. So it's all sweat equity. And there's real hard costs. So it's at, at that level, at our level, it's all self-funded. Mm-hmm. And if you believe in this enough and you want to get involved, come on and bring your pocketbook with you. <laughs> so how do people learn more about this, uh, how to get involved? I mean, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like a great opportunity to plug in at the ground floor, which I think could be a very exciting sport that is watched globally and hopefully in the Olympics. How do, yeah, how do so people get involved? How do people find you? We, there's the, they get involved at the, at the national level. So every, uh, most countries now have national federation so they're usually obstacle course racing something ocr uh or usa ocr um is the american one or the us one usa ocr obstacle sports canada is the canadian one uh and then we've got uh docra danish obstacle course racing and on and on there's 75 national member federations covers all of the countries pretty much with obstacle racing of any form um you get involved with your national federation so volunteer yourself go in and get in a committee and, you know, become a member. Um, and then if you want to represent, then you can represent kind of up the ladder. Uh, and we're still looking for people. We're fairly well put together. We've got about 70 people in governance at the international level representing all of the, the five continental zones. 
uh, and most of the countries. Um, but we're still looking for good, able, smart people who are passionate about the sport and they can bring something to the sport. It's necessary uh, no matter where the sport is because we want it to be safer, more accessible, cheaper, um, bigger media platform. We want all of that. All right. Well said. I think we'll leave it at that. I mean, thanks so much for taking the time, Ian. It's great to, uh, to riff with you. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Anytime. Thanks so much. I know a lot of you guys have been writing in at podcast.human.com for different questions or topics or subjects that you'd like myself and our research lead, Dr. Brianna Subs, to cover. So let's actually make a Q&A special episode to answer any and all of your questions relating to our own personal performance protocols, our research and backgrounds as biohackers and scientists and business people to, you know, what's going on at Human? You know, what products are we working on? What R&D are we working on? What customers? What are the feedback from the keto nester? Happy to address any and all questions. So shoot us an email at podcast at human.com. And we'll, once we have a big bank of questions, we'll do a special episode. As always, please subscribe for future episodes of the Human Enhancement Podcast. Give us a five-star review on iTunes and send a screenshot to podcast at human.com and we'll send you a free Sprint Mini, our acute focus nootropic. Thanks so much and see you next time.